Hey, well, again, welcome, everybody. It's nice to have you all join us. Again, this is the March 2024 Connect with C Coalition monthly meeting. Um, first and foremost, uh, again, welcome. We are um, Connect with C. We are funded uh, through the in partnership with the Orange County Healthcare Agency through the Mental Health Services Act to promote existing mental health resources here in the county for 16 to 24 year olds per day, transitional age youth. And um, as part of that work, we host this monthly meeting and we like to feature um, speakers, panelists on a variety of topics. And this topic I think is really, um, of course, important one. And particularly, I think there, there are layers to why it's so important. So this month's topic is developing or uh, a, a culturally adaptive and responsive approach to Vietnamese mental health. So on the one hand, the Vietnamese community is, uh, is, a, is a large community here in Orange County, right? Their mental health needs are significant, but also distinct, right? It's important to be mindful of, again, we're talking about a culturally adaptive and responsive approach. So what we're going to talk about today with our two panelists is not only about mental health and the unique mental health needs in the Vietnamese community, but also what does it look like both specifically to the Vietnamese community and in general, some, gener some uh, principles about approaching a culturally adaptive and responsive approach. So um, I'm excited to introduce our two panelists for today. Um, but first and foremost, let me introduce our team. Um, so my name is David Pattison. I'm the project coordinator here with Connect OC um, and Partners for Wellness. And then I'll pass it on to Crystal, and then we'll go from there. Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Crystal Fleischer. I'm the program director with Partners for Wellness and specifically overseeing our Connect OC project. And thank you for being here this morning. We appreciate it. Hi, Hi everyone. Oh, sorry. Go, grab, go right ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Order, the random order we always do. Um, I'm Sarah Chalice. I'm one of the health educators um, on the Connect OC team. Um, and I'll pass it to Camila. Hello, my name is Camila Aro, and I'm also uh, one of the health educators intern. And I'll pass it to Carolina. Hi, I'm Carolina Gutierrez. I am an intern for Connect OC. Great. No VV this morning, right? Okay. Normally we have our, our colleague Vivi Vu on, but she was in doing this at least at this point this morning. Hopefully she'll be able to join us eventually. But nonetheless, um, let's move on to the um the core of today's meeting and introduce our two panelists. So I'm going to introduce um them by name and then leave them the opportunity to introduce themselves, the work they do, and the organization they're with uh, in a little more detail. So we'll start off with um two and then we'll move to Paul. Paul has a bit of a presentation to share with us, and then we're going to dive into our discussion. So, two, welcome. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you, David, for the introduction. Um, my name is Tu, and I'm a program manager at the PPSOS Center. Um, I oversee health projects and help ensure the program's sustainability and enforce expansion. Uh, I'm also a trainer for our Vietnamese Mental Health Culture Competency Training course. Uh, pertaining to service providers who have interacted with the Vietnamese population on a daily basis. Um, for PPSOS, we are the Center for Community Advancement. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that provides community resources to Vietnamese community, including immigration, uh, adult education, uh, as well as you know ESL citizenship classes, vaccination information, occupational safety and health administration training, public health information, and mental health services. Um, our mission is to improve the life of Orange County residents through the delivery of effective and sustainable services. Hey, too good to have you. Nice to see you representing BPSOS, uh, Paul. Um, we'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, and actually now would be a good time if you'd like to bring up the presentation, and we'll go from there. Well, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Crystal, for the invitations, and uh, it's a pleasure to meet everyone on a Good Friday. Actually, it is Good Friday for us who are Catholics. Um, so I want to share a little bit about myself, and then at the end of the presentation, there's a QR code that has more information about me and the details If for those who are interested. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, moving forward and the why it was established and how we integrate cultural, uh, what, what I call as culturally adaptive responses as a philosophy and integrate them in everything that we do. And I hope I can share that with you and uh, see how it can help uh, in what you do and how we can collaborate. 
so as I do the introductions, I think it's going to uh, overlap a little bit, but uh, I'm going to share screen so you can see. Okay. Okay. So here, uh, again, uh, it's uh, Moving Forward Psychological Institute. This is the name of our agencies. And as the slogan underneath says, it's uh, Prevent Crisis, Reduce Costs, and Save Lives. Uh, MFPI for short, because it's a long name to remember and, and to say. So MFPI was established actually during the time when I was working uh, with uh, uh, Gargo Police Department as part of the PERT team. And in that process of working and responding to crisis in the community, uh, my office of partner and I, we come to realize about 80% of the cases that we responded to were preventable. Uh, and so when I responded to the scene and do the interventions, a lot of those uh, situations uh, were successfully escalated and hospitalization uh, diverted. And after when I do the follow-up and give them the additional training and resources, uh, it uh, helped them to uh, prevent from entering uh, the emergency services. And so moving forward, for those who work in the crisis setting, we know that uh, oftentimes people experience that state of helplessness, hopelessness, and eventually led to, leads to suicide ideation is when a person feels stuck. And so if whatever we can do, if we can have them move forward, hence moving forward, right? If we can have them move forward, that means we have successfully helped them to overcome that uh, psychological mental state where they feel stuck. And this is our why. Right? Uh, this is both personal as well as those that uh, have lived experience. Uh, we have lost one life too many to suicide. Mental illness discriminates against no one, affecting best friends, co-workers, spouses, children, parents, teachers, healers, leaders in the communities. Uh, we are all vulnerable to illness, both physical and mental. And the best way for us to prevent suicide is to develop a healthier community. Therefore, together we can prevent crisis, save lives, and reduce costs. Uh, and that's our philosophy and our belief is that to address this, we have to address it as a community. Um, and our roadmap of how we address suicide prevention, I look at the whole spectrum of interventions. And so I start with the prevention aspect. Most of our work is falls in the, the prevention and early intervention mindset and framework. And under the prevention, our overall arch of uh, connecting everything, it's about building connections, helping individuals connect to themselves, connect to others and resources, provide education to raise awareness, and then empowering people to utilize the knowledge and skill that they develop and gain. And then if we need to do the intervention, I'll go a little bit later on about the value of our interventions in all of our programs. We in integrate our care model CARE here stands for compassion, acceptance, reassurance, and empowerment. And so that's the value and the model that uh, we develop to uh, integrate in all of our interventions and approaches. And then the postvention when necessary or needed. And this is where we have the survival of suicide program, as well as a support group and other services that we provide to help provide a support postventions uh, for when someone experienced a crisis already or have lost someone to due to suicide. API here does not stand for Asian Pacific Islander. Uh, I came up with this name as part of a actual conference in uh, 2018. Uh, but API is a crisis response model that I developed, which stands for active prevention and intervention. Meaning that everything that we do, uh, we have to have a mindset to always be proactive, not wait till a crisis to come and then react. And so how do we integrate proactiveness in our policy making, in our program design, in our day-to-day -day interactions? in enough self-care. And then when we do the preventions, we always goes before the interventions. So, so I'll go more on that later. This here share briefly about our visions. Right, again, our main focus is to prevent suicide and everything we do is about preventing suicide. And we do so by the three aspects that I share already, the prevention, the intervention, and the postventions. And this is our values, right? The, the, kind of the care model that uh, we develop and, and, and a model is treating individuals with respect and dignity, right? accepting people where they're at. So this is very much of a, a mental health or social work model of meeting the clients where they're at, not just physically, but mentally, spiritually, uh, and culturally as well, um, reassuring them. And this is the re the reassurance aspect is very important for uh, to address uh, uh, suicide because it's, it's dealing hope. 
And then empowerment is also key because we want individuals to be able to be self-sufficient and be able to have their own choices to make. Okay. These are just some of our highlights since uh, MFPI was established. Uh, when I started MFPI, uh, it was just mainly a private practice. Myself and a couple of clinicians mainly focusing on doing therapy aspect of it. Uh, but uh, down the lines, especially since the uh, pandemic, uh, we kind of, uh, I took the leap of faith and I uh, left the county, my full-time job at that time. And I uh, focused full-time on MFPI uh, to respond to the increasing crisis and suicide in the community. And so since 2020, when we established the Moving Forward Together coalitions, well, we, without any funding, based on all private uh, donations and uh, fundraising and, uh, and sponsorship, we were able to cook, prepare, distribute, and deliver over 85,000 hot meals to residents in 16 different cities in Orange County. Uh, and then 2021, I established the suicide, the Vietnamese Suicide Prevention and Response Coalitions. And I'll go more into that in a bit. And then last year, or 2022, I established the International Network, which is called the International Vietnamese Mental Health Association. Because during the pandemic, I was getting, I was receiving a lot of requests for help from Vietnamese clinicians from other states and outside the U.S. as well. And then starting last year is when I happened to be mentoring a public health class at Cal State Fullerton. And through that mentorship for over a year, we kind of branched off and started now doing our own research and partnering up with university to do research on different topics. Uh, some of you may have already seen the stats, the data about suicide in the U.S. This is the current su the suicide stats according to SAMHSA in from 2021. Right. This here is specifically for Orange County data from Orange County uh, uh, of how much how much we have lost 341 uh, from the 2021 uh, coroner's report. Uh, 52 individuals were Asian of heritage. Uh, and then from the suicide, we have uh, 211 suicide deaths. Of the 341 in Orange County, 211 are from a API community. Right. This here is the data specifically from our survival suicide program and our uh, prevention training program. From our suicide prevention uh, response program, 27% uh, of uh, those who we support are family members, those who are impacted by the suicide. And then 73% uh, of what we do in the survival suicide program are actually individuals who have attempted. Uh, and so we all currently have uh, active suicide ideation that we work with to de-escalate. And in 2023, we provided over 389 individual and group uh, therapy sessions. The majority of our, our clients are from Garden Grove, Westminster, and Huntington Beach, even though we are countywide. Uh, and then in terms of prevention aspect, we do training and uh, and so of that, we have done over, uh, over the 3,000 uh, participants attending our training and throughout outreach combined, uh, not just in Orange County, in, but we also do training and outreach in outside of states as well. Uh, we have over 6,000 individuals who have we have reached through our training and our outreach uh, activities. Uh, these are some pictures and highlights of our activities. The left one here is talks about the International Vietnamese Mental Health Association that we started. And these are the first uh, social mixer in person since the pandemic uh, last year uh, or this year, uh, where we have uh, professors from uh, Boston University, from uh, San Diego States, uh, from LA, from Cal State La Fullerton, and then we have clinicians and interns and students attending as well. This here, the next one here, which is with the nuns here, the sisters and the community leaders uh, are both clinicians as well as uh, spiritual and community leaders in the Vietnamese community uh, with whom we have partnered and to build that co coalitions. And through them, we were able to connect and go to all the different churches to do our trainings uh, for the community. And at every event that we do training, there are from 150 to 300 people uh, who attend every of our trainings. Uh, the next one, these are the training that I've done in uh, Florida. Uh, so since uh, last year, I've been traveling through different states in the country doing suicide prevention and response training uh, based on what we've done here in the in Orange County and the word has gotten out through the uh, national religious uh, coalitions. And these are the pictures of our interns and the students part of the workforce development that we do here 
to support those who go into this field, but also try to address the gap of services of lacking uh, mental health workers and uh, providers in the community. Uh, we also did last year uh, a conference focusing on seniors, how because of the pandemic, which really point out the disparity uh, of services and resources and the isolations among our seniors, uh, especially those who are monolingual or eliminate English speakings. Uh, and so in that aspect, during the food distribution drive, we were able to interact uh, and got uh, receive a lot of data from our day-to-day -day interaction with those seniors when we deliver food. And so we organized a, a conference uh, last year um, and where we partner up with many community members and uh, agencies uh, to be able to share the different dynamics that's impacting the, uh, the seniors in the communities and the mental health challenges. And then this down here talks about our training program for both interns, but also for healthcare providers, first responders. Our trainings are very, uh, it's what we call life simulations, where we actually either hire someone who has lived experience to role play themselves and that situations that they have experienced and utilize the skill set and the knowledge that we train to apply uh, to that scenarios. And these are service opportunities. Uh, we call the uh, what we do as opportunities because everything that we do are a privilege. It's not something that uh, uh, we have to do uh, or that uh, we are guaranteed that we can do. So every time someone uh, comes to us, it's a privilege for us. It's an opportunity for us to connect. And so our opportunities that we have been doing since we have founded have been organizing, planning, and uh, delivering conferences statewide. And now we are organizing the first international mental health conference in October uh, 3rd and 4th of this year, sponsored by HCA. Uh, we are peer mentorship support group to the national and local level. We organize as well as participate in health fair or wellness fair. We do health education in the community, in the Vietnamese community, uh, but we don't limit it uh, just for the Vietnamese community. We do shoot outreach uh, activities, but uh, starting next week, we have a new program that, that will transition our street outreach and or will combine our street outreach to housing navigation as well. Uh, we have uh, received uh, a water contract with the states to be able to help individuals with housing needs. And so we'll be able to help them to connect and have the security deposits uh, as well as other services to help them and get tr transition into permanent housing. We do workforce development to help uh, train uh, interns as well as those who want to enroll into our, uh, our mental health apprenticeship program, where it is certified through us and through the Federal Department of Labor. Uh, and then we do problem gambling. Uh, a lot of people are not aware, problem gambling is one of the biggest uh, addictions in the Vietnamese community. Alcohol, problem gambling are the two biggest addictions and uh, challenges in the Vietnamese community. Unfortunately, right now, we are the only one in the States who are focusing on the Vietnamese community. Uh, and so uh, right now, I only have two providers, uh, another clinician here in, in, uh, in, my, in, uh, in my agency and myself who are Vietnamese speaking, who are able to uh, are, are trained and authorized by the state to be uh, gambling treatment providers. Uh, and then we do clinical trainings and services as well when we do therapy. Uh, we also integrate working with the younger generations and how now so many people on social media uh, rather than just scrolling mindlessly or being targeted by social uh, targeted marketing. Uh, I, uh, we develop what's called the MIT team. It stands for Media Impact Team to utilize the social media as a positive platform to bring about positive impact in society. And so we use that to do our outreach, to do our public education on mental wellness and our different aspects of it. So you can follow us uh, on both Instagram, Facebook, uh, as well as LinkedIn. Uh, to, to get more information. We do culturally adaptive translation services. And when we do translate, we translate four tier levels. Uh, we have actually four layers of translations and field testing to ensure that the material that we translate is culturally appropriate to the population that they're targeting for whatever material that they are presenting to. So if it's to the seniors, if it's to the older, uh, younger generations, if it's to the Vietnamese, let's say for, from the Northern, Central or Southern, and then there's a subgroup. So we have, so in our translation, we're very careful on how we translate so that it, it is culturally adaptive. Uh, we focus a lot on training because training is our key part of prevention for suicide and early intervention. Uh, the more people are trained, the more, uh, just like CPR, the more people are equipped with the knowledge in the tool, then the more likely that people are available 
when there is a crisis or where someone experienced mental health challenges that can need help. We do coalition building because we believe in community, we believe in collaboration, such as this coalition here. None of us can do this alone and none of us have enough resources and manpower to be able to address what we call as community issue, not just individual. Uh, and community here is not just ethnic community, but all of us living in one area. Uh, so we believe in, in the genuine collaborations to be able to help our communities of all uh, groups. And now recently, since last year, we have embarked upon a journey of doing research because that's another reason why I named our, our agency as Moving Forward Psychological Institute. And the, the, the institute part, is uh, the vision is to be able to have everything that we do be backed up by research and data. And so in that way, we can have evidence-based as well as practice-based approach that can support what we do in cultural adaptations as well as clinical modalities or uh, outreach and engagement uh, or, and communications uh, techniques uh, that can be able to be adaptive and help other communities. And then our advocacy, we advocate not just on the legislative level, we advocate on all of us, including our own internal. We advocate within the university, we encourage students to advocate those who are intern, right? They're not getting the support that they need from the university, how do you advocate for yourself? If you're not getting the support from the internship site, how do you advocate for yourself? Uh, because coming from a social work model, for the, the social justice side, we need to be able to advocate because that's one way to help people, people from preventing to feeling helpless and hopeless. And these are our current research uh, projects that we're working on. We're focusing on the Alzheimer's disease and problem gambling on 988 and emergency response uh, data as well as the approach is, is a cultural adaptive. So I've been, uh, we've been working with 988 folks and uh, I've just had a meeting with the states, the Department of Public Health and uh, we are going to try to somehow partner up to collaborate to get the, both local and national data to uh, analyze and to uh, make recommendations for cultural uh, adaptive uh, re uh, responses. And then we are also in the process in partnership with UCI, Cal State Fullerton and us. We are developing the first, I believe in the country, the Community Vietnamese I IRB. Uh, and so this is uh, for those who are not familiar with IRB. So anyone that goes through research and publication, has to go to the I, I, the internal review board that could be from the university side, but we determined uh, we wanted to develop our own community IRB because there has been many cases where researchers and data that will come from the Vietnamese community did not go back to the Vietnamese community and part of our cultures were appropriated. And so we want to be able to protect the values and the histories that we have, but also be included in the part to make sure that the information that being shared and, and researched upon is inclusive and really represent uh, us as Vietnamese communities here. Uh, and so that's pretty much it. And then the opportunity here is for you as well as for everybody else is how do we integrate cultural adaptations in everything that we do? Not just when you work with the Vietnamese community, but with all ethnicity. And even if you're white and you're working with someone who's white, that does not mean that you're culturally competent. It's, 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 even though I'm Vietnamese, this doesn't mean that I'm culturally competent within the Vietnamese community because there are subculture in every in every ethnic uh, conclave, right, enclave. And so learning the techniques and the strategies to be able to connect with the individuals for who they are, right? That's the part, that's the interpersonal as well as the generational aspect of it, that's cultural adaptive, that we can utilize for both the clinical aspect, for the policy aspect, for the program designs, the outreach aspect, and for the design of either marketing material, outreach material, education material, uh, or just the interactions aspect of it. And then partnership, again, coalition and partnership is key uh, for us because adaptations, a lot of generations that uh, a lot of communities that come here to the US have a history of trauma, intergenerational trauma, and then all those aspects as well. And then now combined with mental illness, mental health aspect of it, financial challenges, right? Asian hate incidents rising as well. It hasn't decreased just because the media doesn't cover it, doesn't mean that it has decreased. And then now with the upcoming election, there's gonna be so much stuff that's anxiety is provoking and stress uh, provoking already. And so those are things that we need to be able to be in a upfront, uh, be proactive. Even if we're not involved in, not, I don't wanna say politics, I wanna be more civic engagement, right? In, in the aspect of it, to be able to protect, uh, protect our freedom, protect our, de our democracy, but also to help each other to erase our voices. And then I also love, the research part, right? How can we continue to advocate and get more funding for the local community to do local research, community participatory research, 
uh, because of the, the data and the relationship working with the ethnic communities has to well, involve trusted voices. Uh, and because the community will not participate in any clinical trial study or in participate in any research if they don't trust. They don't trust the system, system, they don't trust the government, and then those who come to the community do not represent them or are not consistently present with them. And they feel used, right? You just get our data and then you uh, get your funding and then, then you leave. So that's in a nutshell about what MFPI does and what we've done and uh, where we're going. So the QR code on the left here, top left here, takes you to the, our website. The QR code on the top right here takes you to our training uh, list of all the different trainings that we do, uh, that we do training for individuals, for agencies, and for communities as well. And then the bottom right uh, QR code is about my uh, CV, but also want to know more about the details of my histories uh, as well. And so that's pretty much all. And then I will stop sharing and then go back to the agenda for you, David. Great. Right. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, you know, there's a few things that really jumped out to me. I think thinking about our conversation around a culturally adaptive um, approach to mental health, and particularly in this case, mental health in the Vietnamese community, <clears throat> there are um, multiple layers when we're talking about um, uh, how we approach it. On the one hand, um, you know, you highlighted, I think it's really important. It is a mistake to assume that because you have done some kind of training or because you've worked with a particular community or individuals in a community before that you are then culturally competent, right? And even the term is one that we're moving away from, I think, as a as a field, right? Because the idea that one could be competent um, rather than taking an adaptive or responsive approach um, is maybe a mis, uh, mistaken outlook, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea that one could be um, uh, you know, one need to, to recognize that just because the individual person in front of you is also part of a community or a culture, it's not uh, a one-to-one -one where you can assume that everything that you've ever learned about that culture applies to this individual. At the same time, there are subcultures in any culture, right? Subgroups. And then beyond that too, there's a need for us to take a more community level approach in the field, not just with individual clinicians working with an individual or a couple or family, but also when you talk about the need to develop something like a community IRB, that's so huge and can be a model for a lot of other communities because there's a little bit of a sense, you know, to use the phrase, right? Nothing about us without us, right? Mm -hmm. That if somebody's going to be doing research about a particular community, that community needs to have not just the capacity to at some level own that data, but also to be able to voice, contribute meaningfully and shape the research that's being done and what the entrant the deed interests are and what the outlook is and what the intentions are with that research. So um, <clears throat> I wanna transition a little bit here and focus on one particular aspect of a community approach mm -hmm. to culturally adaptive mental health that you touched on. And would you be willing, would you share a little bit more about um, both the Vietnamese Suicide Prevention and Response Coalition and the International Vietnamese Mental Health Association, what the aim of those are and how they came together, what the inspiration for them were? Sure. So the Vietnamese Suicide Prevention and Response Coalition started out of necessity, basically, uh, because during the pandemic, I still remember the first uh, three months of uh, 2021, uh, my office was getting called almost on a daily basis, every day, every week, for almost three months from so community members who have shared or request for help because either they know someone who have lost, uh, who've, uh, a family member who died from suicide, a relative or they themselves or someone that they know who are actively suicidal. Uh, and so during that time, I, uh, I'm not sure, no, I haven't uh, left the county yet. So I was still working full time at the county. And so I was overwhelmed organizing with the food distributions uh, of, of, uh, as a volunteer and then working in the county and then working part time here to assist with the uh, clinical needs in the community. And so I basically, uh, I pray. I, I pray that I'm overwhelmed, I'm exhausted, I don't have enough resources. And the day after I pray, I receive a phone call from the Mother Superior from the religious group that's called Lover of, of the Holy Cross. The night after, after I, the, 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 the day after I, I pray, I receive a phone call from her and she shared with me that the sisters, the nuns who are stationed and work at different churches in Orange County have been bringing up their concern of the youth that they work with who are suicidal. 
and that the sister don't know what to do to help them. And because of our mutual connection, she came to me to see how I can help. And so we had a, that conversation together right now. And so far as like, we are each other's prayer, answer to our prayers uh, because I need more manpower and I need more resources to be able to pass the messages and, and, and the resources to more people. And so the sister, the mother superior uh, designated a full-time sister to work with me uh, on this. And so I was very glad. And that sister is also a clinician. Uh, she's a, a recent graduate of a, uh, with the MFT. And, and so this allows her to be able to uh, continue to utilize her mental health training as well. And so together we invited uh, church leaders from the different churches, uh, as well as clinicians in the communities and then volunteers. And we have some retired individuals in the community who are from LA County, but they drive to Orange County every time for meeting, every time for events. And so there was so much interest and uh, realization of needs to address our community needs. So we formed a coalitions and initially we, there were only five of us and now we branch out to about 10 of us. And we volunteers, we come on a regular basis, volunteers to plan for activities. And so out there we organize the model that I do in the training that the same that I'm doing right now outside of, uh, uh, outside the state is that we do training on a three tier level. We do the training for the infrastructure to the leaders, the church leaders, uh, whether they are the religious leaders or different uh, leadership role within a church so that we can help them, train them to design an infrastructure for their community, for their church, so that they can continue to support once we're done with the trainings. We do a training that involves parents so that the parents can become aware of signs and symptoms, not just among the kids, but among themselves as caregivers, but also to develop a support group internally for parent support group. So then that way they can continue to support and be self-sufficient. And then we do a training for youth and young adults. Usually it's just from uh, high school level to college level. But uh, the last training we just did last month, uh, we had uh, kids who are in the middle school age level. So we've been, re been requested to do younger now. So in, in all, so the coalition is now coming together to bring them back to design and the activities that we've done. We've taken uh, the project success curriculum that we've designed at the MFPI. So project success is a curriculum that we designed of 20th century life skill uh, that I've uh, identified during my work in crisis that were essential to prevent suicide. And so I, I turned those into a, a structured uh, class uh, curriculum. And now we've taken it and modifying a little bit more to turn it into actual activities or game, interactive games. I take those life skills, turn into interactive games when we, when we do training in the community. Because I've learned that when we do presentation and training in the community for the kids, after school, they are already exhausted from the full day of classroom already. They don't want to see another teacher talking, especially when their parents are forcing them to attend. And mm -hmm. so when I turn those life skills into act interactive games and activities, they are all in it. They were playing mm -hmm. it, interacting it, and then afterwards we process that with them. And so well, after we process, we extract the lessons from the game, from the activities, and the kids realize, hey, I'm utilizing this right now, so I can do it later on. And so, so that's one of our intention and the, and the spirit of our coalition is to want to prevent suicide and working with the religious group. Uh, right now, we currently only work with the Catholic community, but we do want to work with the Buddhist and other communities. So we have now touched base to work, try to work with the interfaith communities in Orange County, uh, because in the past I've done training for the interfaith community. So we are reaching out to other faith group to be able to address suicide as a community, not just as one uh, religion or one faith group. And so that's the reason why the Vietnamese Suicide Prevention and Response Coalition was established. And we are still continuing to do training and uh, conferences. Uh, we've been requested now to go to San Bernardino County now to go do training for the community over there because uh, there are no Vietnamese providers in San Bernardino uh, over there. And the churches over there are also struggling to find support for the suicide crisis in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for the same spirit, that's why I also developed or established the uh, Vietnamese Mental Health, the International Vietnamese Mental Health Association. It's with the same idea because clinicians from other countries who are Vietnamese and other uh, states in the country in the U.S., during the pandemic, mm -hmm. they have no support group. Because I can relate because when I first graduated and I worked in Chicago, I was the only Vietnamese speaking clinician in the whole state. And so I was seeing patients and clients who are driving four or five hours in the county to come for services. 
and I got burned out within six months. That's why I left Chicago and moved back to California because mm. I was alone as a clinician. I didn't have anyone to consult with. I was mm. new in the field and I got burned out because the needs were so high and I feel so powerless to be able to help. And so during the pandemic, when the other clinicians and then students uh, reach out for help, uh, I didn't have the capacity to help one-on-one. -on -one. And so I formed the, uh, the association to help more group meeting and group support. And we transitioned from just supporting to now wanting to be the authority, the body of authority to review treatment modality that, uh, that may work or can work with the Vietnamese community internationally. We'll mm -hmm. also review research and also we participate in research that focusing on Vietnamese community We'll also focus and we develop a coalition to do cultural adaptations, translation services for mm -hmm. providers as well as for laymen. Mm -hmm. So in that way, when we communicate on, in, the, in the community, we can use terminology that's not clinical, but we also want to use clinical term in the provider setting so that the community knows what, how to present their needs, how to present and describe their symptoms in a clinical uh, the way that the providers can save time to understand uh, more accurately. And so that's the part. So uh, within the Vietnamese community, language is so diverse. We have over, we have 54 different ethnic groups in the Vietnamese community. So that means different, 54 different uh, dialects uh, mm -hmm. and languages. And so when we translate, we have to be able to be mindful of who we're uh, translating for and also the different migration way from the uh, pre-1975, the fall of Saigon, afterwards, the migrations, and then uh, in the 2000 years, and so because language is organic and so as culture, when we do translation and services, sometimes we are not mindful of that aspect of it. So the language that we use may be triggering for one community, for one population, for the Vietnamese community. And I could share as an example, when I used to work with CAT team in the county, and the CAT team has the brochure translated in Vietnamese. When we pass out those flyers in the Vietnamese community, no one wants to take it. And I was a little bit disturbed and so far. This is resources. And so when I asked the community members, how come? They look at right in the front, right? They translated uh, the CAT team, uh, centralized assessment team. They use the term Đội Ngô, right? Which is uh, it's an accurate term uh, translation, but that's a term that's a communist term. And because it's, it has an associated relative, uh, connotation to communism, the Vietnamese community in Orange County is highly triggered by communism. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, they do not utilize the captive services, nor the, the uh, material that's uh, passed out by the county. And so, so that's why I, I advocated within the county during the time to be able to change the translation. Uh, and so that's an, that's an example of why the International Vietnamese Mental Health Association was founded. Yeah, that's great, Paul. So, I mean, a couple of things, right? It's, you know, some things that stood out to me from what you were saying on a, on a higher level is that, um, you know, thinking about a culturally adaptive response right not only were you responding to the needs expressed needs in the community but specifically who are you partnering with right you're partnering with faith communities faith communities are huge in a number of ethnic communities but they have a special role in the vietnamese community we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit too you and i talked about this the other day but um but also, you know, when fellow clinicians reached out, you both drew from your own experience as an early clinician, but and could empathize with their experience, but also drew now from your expertise years later, having worked in a variety of contexts and worked collaboratively in the Vietnamese community. And you saw a way forward for kind of what we were just talking about earlier, similar to the development of the community um, internal review board, that that there is this sense of like, hey, translation isn't just about a one for one, let's put this word into the closest equivalent in Vietnamese. There are multiple subcultures, right? There are therefore multiple dialects. And even beyond that, there are cultural factors at play in translation, historical factors, social factors, political factors that need to be taken into account so that what's conveyed is not just an accurate translation, but is a meaningful one, is one that communicates to the community, the things that they really need to hear in ways that they that they can hear them meaningfully. Two, I want to check in with you. I want to um, follow up on a couple of things here. One, 
Um, this this conversation we were just having Paul, you know, with Paul very much connects to the conversation that you and I had the other day about the term mental health, right? Very common term in the field, right? It's the, it's the one of the more descriptive terms used broadly of the field, right? But um, let's talk a little bit about the term mental health in Vietnamese, where that term sometimes can cause more issues than it can help using that term. And are there appropriate alternatives to using using that term? What are the pros and cons of each? Thank you so much. So for um, Vietnamese translation of mental health, we have uh, two different um, translation, which is which are tam tam tang and tam li. So usually tam tang is medically accurate term. It describes uh, mental health illnesses and mental state, but increase the stigma within the community as they usually associate it with being crazy. Uh, tam li, on the other hand, not very much medically accurate, but it describes like feelings, psychological state more, but pose no stigma to the community. So tam tang can be used in direct translation, like medical paper or uh, diagnosis, while tam li can be used to promote like services to the community, uh, so they can be more receiving. We also want to break through the stigma by normalizing the word tam tang. Um, however, we can do that um, slowly after introducing them into the term. Um, according to our focus group, um, that gather around like 30 community members, they would be more likely to attend a workshop or activity if the flyer states uh, tam li rather than tam tang because that uh, trigger a lot of um, feelings. It, it also poses like a stigma associated with uh, being crazy. Um, and that's the, the input from the community members as well. Mm. There's, a, there's a, a pathologizing effect that, that can be in play in the first term, right? That somebody, when they, it's associated, I'm seeking services for my mental health, might be the term we use in English, but that first term in Vietnamese, there's a sense of like, well, you're crazy, you need help, right? Yeah. But in the second term, we talked a little bit about, there's a sense of like, it's almost a little bit of a self-improvement, like, okay, I'm learning how to better deal with my own feelings, my own emotions, my own emotional states, and become more aware of them and explore them a little bit more. So there's a sense of whether or not I have an, an, an illness, an issue going on, um, pathology, I can seek out these services and improve and grow more generally as a person. Does that, does that seem right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then as um, we have experienced it, um, since we promote for our services, the workshop, we use the, the first term, um, nobody comes and, we wonder like, oh, why nobody comes? And, you know, like we ask the community members, we ask our students and they're like, you say, you saying that means like if we go into your workshop, that's signal that we are crazy. So they mm -hmm. don't want to, they don't want to attend any workshop or like services that have any connection with that word. Even though right now um, people are understanding more and they get a little bit like familiar with the word thumb tongue. It's not like, you know, associated with being crazy. Um, they still have a uh, stigma against that. And we, if we want to promote like the services or we want to promote anything for people to attend, to attract people, then we use like the second term. But then when they get in here, then we will explain to them what those two words mean and nothing posts like any, you know, uh, negativity or anything. Yeah, yeah. It, this checks is something that, that, that Paul was talking about as well. And, and something that I'm observing from um, the conversation on both fronts is that, you know, it's a mistake to assume that as an organization, as a provider, that because I have something translated into a language, uh, job done, right? People now know, now can read my flyer and know how to access my services, right? Mm -hmm. There's a need to really involve the community in offering active feedback. I'm thinking about Paul's example of the flyer um, describing the services the CAT team officer uh, offers from years ago. You talking about, you know, we were offering a training, we we're using the first term and nobody was showing up and we were trying to figure out what the deal was. So I know that as part of that process, as part of really wanting to, to draw from the experience and expertise of the community, um, you all have been doing focus groups at BPSOS. Can you tell a little bit about what inspired those, what you all have been working on, and what you've found so far? 
Yeah, so uh, uh, at PPSOS, we have um, three themes of focus groups. So we, we conduct like focus group for both um, community members and CBOs. Um, so we break it down into like three different themes for three years. Um, for the first theme is about like, mental health knowledge. The second one is mental health uh, service assess. And theme three is all about like, mental health policy that affects the access to um, mental health services, insurance, and um, other required intakes. Um, so for the community members, the first theme, uh, mental health knowledge, we talk about like general understanding about mental health stigmas and how to increase knowledge and awareness. Um, for the CBOs, we ask them about their experience in serving the clients, uh, what makes them hesitate to seek help. Uh, for theme two, mental health service assess, we go a little bit in depth and we, we, we talk to the community members regarding like barriers, challenges in assessing mental health services. Since those um, participants who attend our second one, they are required or like they, they should have, um, you know, like attended like mental health or like assessed mental health services already, or they planning to do that. Um, and then for the for the CBOs, we asked them about like providers' coach competency and how it affects the treatment process. And we are planning for theme three, uh, mental health policy. Uh, at that at the focus group, we are planning to ask community members what have hindered promote like or like promote access to mental health services, so we can focus on that more. And for CBOs, we um, want to, you know, improve the process. And the value of conducting separate focus group for community members and CBOs lies in the unique um, perspective and expertise that each group brings to the table. Uh, for community members, um, by engaging directly with the community members, um, we can gain like, insights into the life experiences, uh, challenges and needs of individuals seeking mental health support. Uh, this approach ensures that the voices of those directly affected by mental health issues are heard and informs targeted interventions to address their concerns. Mm -hmm. And then for the CBO side, they play a, a crucial role in providing support and services to vulnerable uh, populations. Their firsthand experiences, knowledge of the local context, uh, provide valuable insight into like systemic challenges and opportunity for improving mental health service delivery. And by convening separate focus group for CBOs, uh, we can gather like targeted feedback on uh, service provision, uh, culture competency, policy advocacy efforts. Uh, enabling more like effective collaboration and advocacy for a positive change in the mental health landscape. Mm. Yeah, I um, I see. You know, well, let me ask as a follow up. Like, what for you? I know we talked about this a little bit the other day. What are some of the major takeaways that, from what you all have been doing so far? What are some things the community has has fed back? Some of the CBOs have fed back that have helped. Um, that for you has been a major takeaway? So we have like a few really good takeaways. So we have learned from the community members that um, cultural co differences have built up anxiety and mental issues for a lot of them, uh, especially the older populations who just have um, came here, like who just came here to the United States. They have shared that stressors have occurred um, on a daily basis when they receive like government um, paperwork in their mailing address as they could not complete the process due to limited English. So for those who finally seek help from uh, professionals, they now encounter um, prolonged wait period, um, issues with insurance that lead to the delay in seeing therapists, uh, judgment from the family members, from the communities, and even providers or staff themselves. Uh, section being booked too far apart um, immediate like helps are too difficult to navigate. Uh, and then they have shared that providers, um, some of them, they lack like coach competency as well. Mm -hmm. For example, like I have a, I have a, a participant shares that they went to therapists and the therapist said that, oh, if you have an issue with your family member, then you better just move out. And you know, like how the Vietnamese, um, 
publish and the community, they value like the collectivistic um lifestyle a lot. Like they they that's within their um their their perspective that they have to leave the family, they have to take care of their their, their parents, they have to take care of their kids within like one you know like house they leave like generation with generations and by telling them you need to move out is not very like culturally competent and um for the cbo side we have learned about the urgent need of bilingual staff um a lot of like retention struggles the lack of HIPAA training understanding uh immigration related fears um learn about like cultural uh, interpretation of mental health issues, and they have hindered them from providing best services and cares to their clients. Yeah. Yeah. The, the couple of things that come to mind, you know, so so I'm hearing from you too, there's, there's a, some of the recognition is, especially from the feedback from the community, the need for um, better pathways of access to services mm -hmm. and clinicians who are more attuned, adaptive, responsive, to cultural factors and to the needs of somebody who's part of a member of the community, but also recognizing there are some, some factors, some generation gap factors that come into play and, and each of those things need to be considered. And this, this kind of, you, we touched on a need for cultural competence in, in, in part of your feedback, the feedback that you all received. And thinking about the conversation we've had, you know, so far, um, I want to maybe like Take a little bit of a step back. I know that we've talked about as a field, we're moving away from the term competence because it really isn't sufficient to describe what's necessary in terms of meaningfully, meaningfully engaging someone who's a member of a culture and part of that and, and, and they're being part of that culture, being a person, an individual in that culture, and even taking into account the possibility that I as clinician or as provider may not be a member of that, that community, that culture. And so needing to be mindful of where there might be misses or gaps there in understanding and experience. But thinking about the term competence, you know, we use this language in the mental health field and other contexts all the time. A clinician talks about their scope of competence, right? A good clinician only works in the scope of the, their competence, right? They only work to the extent or use a, a model or something like that to the extent that they have some competence relative to that model or with that community or whatever it might be. And so what I'm wondering is, as we're moving away from the competence language, right? As a clinician, competence is, is comfy. I can take some trainings and I can say, I've got competence. I can take a, I can feel bold in approaching working with this community, right? Um, I can imagine for some people, they might hear some of what we're talking about and go, well, man, I don't know that I'll ever be able to get a grasp on all of this right? It's, it's, it should show that competence language kind of still sticking in our minds. Like I'm waiting for the time when I can say I've got a grasp on all this and so I can move forward. So for both of you, why should or how does a clinician or another provider seeking to be adaptive and responsive rather than focusing on competence, why should they feel con um, maybe confident isn't the right word, but why should they still be bold enough to engage working in a community where that's inviting them towards an adaptive and responsive, culturally adaptive and responsive approach and, and shelving for now the idea of competence. Paul. I like this conversation because I had this many times in the past at conferences as well. And I think the mindset is when we use the, in the field we have changed or we have moved away from a cultural competency to cultural humility, right? Mm -hmm. And even now we have moved beyond that in the aspect. That's why I like to use the word uh, cultural adapt adaptation or adaptive approach. Cultural competency, how I look at it is the what, what you know, mm. right? So for, for employer, that's easy to measure, right? Because it's a checkbox you can measure so that you can check off to be able to say, this person knows this and this and this. For relationship why, what you know may or may not be accurate may or may not help give you the window to connect with me. So mm. cultural humility goes more towards the how, the mm. process. So what you know and how you know it and how you use it to connect me to you or connect you to me, that will strengthen that, that relationship with that connections for the purpose of whatever services or outcome you want. Right? 
So I use the term cultural competency mainly because with all training, with all employers we need, and, and research, right? If it's quantitative versus qualitative, we have something, we have to have a measurement tool mm -hmm. to be able to say, hey, I know enough to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't limit relationship or services based on only what we know. Because you can go to all the school, you can have all your degrees. And your degrees is a representation, right? And an acknowledgement of what you know. But we all know for a fact, but that certificate does not mean that we know it all. Mm -hmm. Because by the time we're done with our program, we have already forgotten more than 60% of what we are taught in class. Mm -hmm. And so we can't say we're competent when we graduate. We need to probably know less with it, right? But so culture and humility goes back to that process. Okay, I know that I don't know enough. And because I know I don't know enough, that helps me to be humble so that when I approach this topic, I approach this conversation, I approach with an openness, with an open mindset to learn. Whether it's interacting with another Vietnamese or a non-Vietnamese, I know that I left Vietnam when I was seven as a refugee. I grew up in a village. And so I'm not a city guy. And mm. so my mindset and my knowledge is not from the city, it's from the countryside. I love the countryside. Mm. And so when I interact with Vietnamese right here, and I grew up here in the U.S. in a non-Vietnamese community, I've only moved to Orange County or moved to Orange County after I have left California for over 10 years mm. when I moved back, right? And so when I moved into Orange County is when it's my first time living in this huge Vietnamese community, which I feel very sometimes claustrophobic because <laughs> I'm so used to being diverse uh, aspect of it. And, and so that's the aspect. So cultural um, humility is about the process. And then cultural adaptation or cultural adaptive responses is how do you take what I know about myself, about you, about our processes and modify it to adapt to the situation that we're in right now. Because the person I'm working with, even that person is, is also someone who's a refugee who escaped Vietnam by boat. For example, even if they escaped Vietnam at, at the same age as I did, at seven years old, their experiences would be different. They grew up here in the US differently, right? And so when I take that, I, I adapted to that model and in our translation, that's why we do. We adapt it because we te feel tests with the exact population that we want to connect with. What's the purpose of us spending all these resources, all this energy, all this training, right? To communicate, to connect, but the outcome doesn't achieve that because our delivery process is not effective. Yeah. Yeah. It strikes me that, you know, we, we are not simply here talking about training content. This is the old model, not to say that there isn't a place for that to under, better understand some key factors, history, social factors about a particular community, but we're training a process, right? When somebody is experienced, when somebody's a clinician, for example, is committing themselves to undergoing training to be better uh, culturally adaptive, relative to the Vietnamese community. The training is a, is about a process, even more than it is about content. And it's here, you know, I appreciate what you're saying. It's it's so easy to think if I'm a, a manager, right, to look, okay, well, all my clinicians are trained on CBT, on HIPAA compliance, and cultural competency with the Vietnamese community, right? No, but what we're talking about here is something more akin as a clinician and as a provider for that matter, the work I do to build a therapeutic alliance. We're talking about a process here that is, might have some familiar factors, some familiar elements, but it is it is about a relationship, right? Um, at the same time, you all, both both MFPI and Paul, the work you're doing, and two, the work that you are doing at BPSOS, are building out resources, knowledge bases, places of reference, places to better connect with the community for other providers so that this process is um, uh, uh, better facilitated. So too, I'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on, on this particular topic in terms of, um, you know, if I'm a provider, you know, the old model of just, okay, I'm culturally competent, I did a two hour training, I'm culturally competent, shelving that, and instead moving towards this more process oriented approach, right, adaptive approach. What, what, um, what, why should I have um, energy and hope behind that approach and not think to myself, oh, it's too much, it's too overwhelming kind of thing. 
Yeah, so I like the fact that we have different terminologies mm -hmm. to address, you know, like the understanding and awareness of um, certain cultures. Um, as I as I um, have viewed it, is culture competency is more about like skills, you know, like more about how we understand about like the like like one's cultural uh, background. When culture humility is more about like awareness like it's more about like oh so that's my um background so um they view like others background they want to acknowledge it so that kind of you know um support each other so at uh, ppsos for the training that we are having um we we don't tell people like so this is what the vietnamese people are doing so just assume that everyone who is vietnamese they are doing the same thing so we teach them the skills, we teach them how to be mindful, how to ask questions, how to approach the person um, in order to know about their culture. Uh, so it's very different uh, from, you know, like assuming uh, the person is from like certain culture, they act the same thing, they practice the same thing. Uh, they're from, you know, like the same uh, dynamics. But rather than that, I, I would like to see, you know, like the providers who come to the scenes and kind of know how to interact with them, know how to approach like the conversation, how to say certain things so that they can be more open-minded and then they can talk to you more about that. Uh, so that's the culture, uh, humility and competency that I want to see for other clinician. Um, Cause like, according to our um, focus group participant input, they don't really, prefer, you know, like the ethnicity of the providers. They have shared like very straightly that they don't care about the ethnicity as long as that person listen to them or like listen to what they want to share. Um, I, I do have like a participant share that they have like a, like a non-Vietnamese uh, therapist and they love that person because that person doesn't know about Vietnamese culture, but they talk in the way that can open up the participant, the client, and that's all they need to know about. And that's how they can share about the cultures, that's how they can share about the background, family dynamics. So the, the, the clinician can go around and see what worked the best for them. Um, so that that's what I want to see. That's the interaction that I want to see when we talk about like culture competency or culture like humility. Yeah, it's, it strikes me that some of the things we're talking about are really at the end of the day, for um, skills and orientations for any good clinician. So you're talking about that folks don't really care about the ethnicity of the clinician as long as they feel they're being heard, understood, listened to, right? We also, you and I had a, a bit of a conversation. I'd love to have you commit, comment on this a little bit further. Um, you know, when you're talking about the idea of the, some of the feedback you received in the focus group was an example, as an example, was somebody talking about a clinician who was telling them, look, you just need to move out, right? You just need to set really strong boundaries, basically. With your family and boundaries conversations are ones that clinicians are very familiar with but that clinician also lost sight not just of cultural considerations but also client self-determination right there's a clinician my job is not to tell my client this is what you need to do now go do it my job is to help the client explore what's going to be meaningful and work for them right so um i'd love to hear you comment a little bit further on that i also want to add to this on the back end you know we've been talking a lot about um the way we approach services, but to you and I, Hoxwell talked about the kinds of services that we offer um, can be culturally meaningful or less so. And, and I know that for BPOSS, you all look at combining Eastern and Western medicine as part of the ways you refer people to access services. So would you mind commenting first about, you know, um, about this, this issue of really being um, in, responsive to where the client is going, listening to them, and then, and then from there, um, talk about the kinds of services that are promoted and offered, um, being also culturally adapted. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's important to be aware and keep the tradition and respect the culture while being like effective and sufficient in terms of treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, so therefore, we don't want to say anything. Uh, that can disregard the practices that they have been doing. Um, it's our job to provide information 
and encourage like the good practices. Um, so for example, we are using, you know, like for Vietnamese um, people, we love to use like essential oils um, or green oils when, you know, like it comes to the flu, right? Because like they said that it makes them feel good and relaxes. Um, they can continue to use those. However, it's, an, it's important to let them know the vaccine antiviral medication will actually target the flu virus itself. Right, they they're free to use like the essential oil for the relaxation, but um, here's some piece of information that the vaccine and antiviral medication can actually cure the virus themselves. Um, mental health works the same way. We don't want to disregard their traditional practices, such as a lot of people they uh, believe in the power of prayer, seeking emotional help. Um, we're here. We're here to guide them. Um, how to do that in a way that it will help improve their mental health mm -hmm. alongside therapy sections and other necessary treatments depending on their uh, diagnosis. Um, the way that we do to approach this is to listen. Listen to them, listen to their concerns, having focus groups, understand their worries, gather inputs, taking feedback. Uh, then you can educate them about the topic later. Uh, the conversation comes in both ways. We will express our willingness to listen first, then we can expect them to listen to us. Yeah, yeah. We I love that. We need to be willing to listen to them first, then we can expect or even hope that they'll be willing to listen to us, right? That we are really hearing not just what they say, but what they need, right? Mm -hmm. And being willing to explore that to them, and then therefore being willing to connect them to resources that are meaningful for them, right? Even if my clinician, my expert brain in the background is going, well, that's not going to work, and da da da, you know, you know, re being responsive to what is meaningful for them, right? Prayer and other types of of services or other types of resources that are meaningful for them. And when I hear them in that, when I support them in the things that have been working for them so far at some level, right? Then they may be more open to the possibility of. Here's another tool or approach that might also be useful, right? Paul, I want to um, shift from here, and then we'll 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 wrap up. I think you both were going a little long um, uh, this morning, but um, this connects for me to a conversation, part of our conversation the other day, right? That not only are we looking at offering or promoting resources and tools that are um, culturally adaptive, right? That are culturally coherent. But even the tools that we utilize as providers, as clinicians, we need to recognize are not culturally neutral, right? There are elements at play that may make them more or less useful or that may, where they may need to be adapted. We had a good conversation about EMDR as an example. It can be easy for me as a tra clinician trained, who's trauma-informed, who's trained in EMDR to be, okay, my clinician sitting in front of me, yes, they're Vietnamese. Yes, they've experienced lots of trauma. I know how to treat trauma. Let's do some EMDR as an example. Nothing against EMDR. I personally EMDR trained, but as are you, Paul. You use EMDR. But talk to me about about um, our conversation the other day about why there might be a need to adapt sometimes our approaches, our tools to make them culturally coherent. Yeah, thank you. So with any tool, right, whether it's a language or a clinical modality or techniques, it's very important for us to be mindful that those are tools. Right. And, and and we as the user of this tool, how we use those tool will produce different type of impact. Mm -hmm. So EMDR, just as any other clinical modality, is one of those tools that has been through research, right, and evidence-based practice has been effective in treating dynamics that are trauma-based, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they have shown that it's also effective in anxiety, depression, and other in other clinical dynamics. And so when I was first trained in EMDR, and I was like gung ho using it left and right, uh, whenever I get a chance, and and because I was a skeptic when I first uh, took the training, when I first took the training in the first few hours of the day, because like this is like a bunch of, uh, <laughs> uh, really? yeah, so I, like I said, this is not gonna work. So I, so throughout the whole training, I was quite hesitant to really buy into it, and when I actually practice it and use it with one of my clients. Two, so the, the two clients I'm gonna share. The first client is a non-Vietnamese who I've been, I was treating at that time for more than three years ago already. Uh, 
for complex trauma, for sexual traumas and all the different types of traumas that she has experienced. So for three years, I've been using what I call traditional therapy, right? CBT, psychodynamics, and other form of uh, treatment. When I transitioned over to MDR, within two sessions, all of her PTSD these symptoms are gone, right? Mm -hmm. her, she was able to talk about a topic without even having any triggers before she was not able to. She was able to watch TV and see those traumas on TV, on the news, and not get triggers. She mm -hmm. was able to hold a place that's calm. So I was like, wow, this actually work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was blown away. And then I started utilizing more and more EMDR. And then when I transitioned and adapted that to the Vietnamese community, I was like, oh, there's a whole bunch of complex trauma in the Vietnamese community clients that I work with. So I started implementing a, a EMDR. And I keep getting stuck. It's almost 80 or 90% of the female Vietnamese clients that I work with when I use EMDR, they all started dissociating. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, is it because the Vietnamese people have a higher rate of dissociations? Mm -hmm. Or am I doing something wrong with the protocol that's triggering right, uh, the dissociations? Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of reflections and, and review of my own uh, approach. And then it dawned on me that culturally, right, when I, when I use certain modality, they don't understand the concept. Or the concept doesn't really apply in the Vietnamese community, in, in, in a culture. And so when I switch it to mindfulness meditation, mm -hmm. they were able to move past any part of that they were stuck. And I found out that mindfulness meditation techniques, when I trained them and I, I shared mm -hmm. that with them, they move faster than EMDR. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so now I revert back to my own practice of EMD, of uh, mindfulness practice, which I've been practicing for over 20 years. And I use this a lot more with the veterans community that I work with here than actually EMDR. And I, I, Put the I share with the veterans, the community, and the victims community both modality. These are what's known to work well for this clinical dynamics. Do you want to experience both of it, and then you can decide which one you want to focus on more later on. We do both, and most of the time they, they prefer to go with mindfulness meditation than mm -hmm. EMDR. Uh, and so the practice, the veterans that have used mindfulness meditation in the in treatment and, and outside of session when they practice regularly. Uh, their psychosomatic symptoms are gone, their flashbacks are gone, their anxieties are gone. They were able to get off the medications, their psychotic, antipsychotic medication. One client uh, was able to get off her lupus medication. Uh, it helps her, her anxiety, her stress was so low and so manageable, right, that her lupus was not triggered anymore. And so, and then when she went to her follow up, her doctor was blown away for like, what are you doing that's different? that's contributing to your lupus uh, being so low right now. There's, there's no symptoms. And so once she shared that and they start you know, tapering her off medication, it, it seems to work that as long as she's continued with the mindfulness meditation and the way that we did it, then she got her anxiety in check, her stress in check. And so there's no need for medication and the lupus never came back. Mm. Yeah. I know we were, we were talking a little bit too, that the, in the context of EMDR, the mindfulness meditation helped move through the dissociative experience and allow you to continue to to move forward with reprocessing where that was appropriate right um so so th first thank you both we're running up on time i wish we could we had more time to keep going i i always do but um i appreciate the both of you for being willing to join us i appreciate your both of your expertise and your feedback and your willingness to share about the work you all are doing um so uh here, folks, a couple resources for you. Um, two, BPSOS, Paul, MFPI, um, in terms of not just, you know, we've been talking about the Vietnamese community, but as you've hopefully noticed that we're drawing back also some principles about how we approach a being culturally adaptive in our work in general, right? That it, we're talking here more, it's less about content and more about process. Um, and so, Again, Paul, too, thank you. Um, I'll pass it on now to my colleague, Sarah. We'll check in about things that are coming up for ConnectOC, and then we'll invite you all to share about um, things that you all have coming up. There's also, Crystal um, just posted in the chat a survey. It would be really helpful to us if you would take that survey. It's very short, um, which just helps us think about ways that we should be adapting what we're doing here at the coalition um, to continue to make it better. And so. Uh, thank you all again, and uh, I'll pass on to Sarah.
Thanks, David. And thank you, Paul, and too, for um, just really good insight. It's always sweet to hear about um, just different cultures and um, understanding them better and um, maybe moving forward and um, just having those extra tools in our belt just to be mindful and aware of those things. So thank you so much for that. Um, just a couple updates on our end. Um, we do have a um, event coming up. Um, in partnership with a few uh, a few organizations. Um, it's the Blossoming Together event. Um, it's coming on April 13th. Um, and you are all invited. It's an open invite. It's no cost for you all to attend. Um, there's going to be a ton of resources available. Um, there's going to be cultural performances, wellness activities, um, and there's going to be like a community picnic with food trucks and stuff. So it's going to be super cool. I'm just dedicated to um, celebrating and supporting our diverse populations in Orange County. Um, and I will, oh yeah, Chris already put it in there. Thank you. It's at Great Park in Irvine from 11 to 3. Um, hit that link in her message if you want to register for it. Um, again, it's at no cost to you all. Um, so that will be a really great event. We're really excited. Um, another one, um, we're just in a lot of planning stages for resource fairs coming up at both Irvine Valley College for Sexual Assault Awareness Week um, and Cal State Fullerton in, at the end of April. So just some cool things going on in there. Thank you to our vendors. Um, those of you who are coming, um, we really appreciate your participation and collaboration with us as well. Um, so yeah, those are a couple of our updates. I'm going to open it up to um, you all. Um, if you have um, just an announcement or update you'd like to share, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, yeah, go ahead whenever you're ready. Anyone? Well, Council, feel free to share it in the chat or um, feel free to email me. Um, I'll post my email back in here again and I'll make sure that um, whether you share something right now or you share it just between uh, you and I, um, feel free to um, uh, email and I'll share it when I send out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was somebody from Ocapico here, but I don't see her anymore. Um, but just something related to kind of what we've been talking about and things like that. Um, Ocabica is starting a focus group. Um, so they're starting, they're looking for participants to, um, for a study on Asian uh, American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander like youth. Um, these are paid, like I said, um, and those who are eligible would be any um, mental health providers who work in the OC that specifically serve or um, treat ANHPI um populations or actual youth that are in that community um ages 14 to 25 and they're like a one and a half to two hour uh, focus group in person food is provided and participants will get i think a hundred dollar gift card somewhere um and if you're interested please feel free to reach out to ocapica um they're a great organization um and you can get some really good insight in these focus groups and i think it'd be really beneficial to participate in that if you can. Um, so yeah, if you have more information, I think um, Ocapico would love to hear from you all. So yeah, um, if there are no other updates, again, we thank you so much for coming. Please take our survey um, if you can. That'd be so appreciated um, as well. Our next meeting will be April 26th at um, 10 a.m. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all then. And if you haven't uh, introduced yourself, please feel free in the chat. But have a great weekend and we will talk soon.